Good, 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 good morning. Come on in and sit down. Welcome to Encore. Welcome to Encore. Whether you're sitting with us here in the room or watching live online, it's great to be with you this morning. And welcome to our Valentine's party. I was supposed to wear red. I totally forgot until last second, so I got a hat that's got some red on it. And how many of you know Pastor Keith Batchelor, who recently passed away? Keith actually bought me this hat and brought it back from England. It's a Manchester United hat, soccer hat. So anyhow, uh, which I'm looking forward to celebrating his life. But anyhow, if you're new to, to Sam, our senior adult ministries, here's what you can expect this morning. Some good treats on the way in, right? Wow, how do you choose this morning? There's too many, so many good choices. One of each? Yeah, I think that works. Uh, you can, but some good treats and just fun table time, some worship, and uh, some time in prayer. And then we'll open up God's Word together. Today we're in Philippians chapter 2. And we're usually done about 11.20. Sometimes we go a little bit longer when that teacher guy goes a little bit longer. But we've been, we've been memorizing an incredible hunk of scripture from Philippians chapter 2. And what I wondered is if anybody has a hunk of it memorized and would risk trying to say it in front of everybody else. Anybody? Philippians chapter 2, maybe verses 3 through 5. Anybody? 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 Oh, yes. Okay, we've got one. Of course. All right. And this is so good. This hunk of Philippians, I think, is one of the most impactful ver hunks of verses in the Bible. It talks about Jesus' humility and our need to follow that lead. Okay, you ready to give it a shot, Carol? Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility consider one another as more important than yourselves. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What? <laughs> I'm not done. Okay, well, consider each other as more important than ourselves. Okay, all right, keep going. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do not merely look out for your own interests, but also for the interest of others. Have this attitude in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being, form, and, and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on the cross. Philippians 2, 3 through 8. All right, well, good luck matching that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. But there you heard the whole thing together, and it is just an incredible hunk of Scripture, isn't it, that we've been going through in Philippians chapter 2. Okay, so uh, just before um, our worship team comes up and leads us, here's our fun question that I want you to share around the tables. Now, in a couple minutes, we're going to see the prophet Jeremiah's favorite food. Yeah. The prophet Jeremiah's favorite food. We're going to look at that in a little bit. Any ideas? Okay, well, you'll, you'll get to hear it in a couple seconds. So here's our, here's our table fun question, our fun table question. <clears throat> After Encore today, if you could go anywhere for lunch, where would you go and what would you order? Carolyn's paying, so don't worry about the cost. <laughs> where would you go and what would you order? Go ahead, share that with the people around your table. Okay, okay, all right. I'm curious. I'm curious. A couple people want to share? What, where would you go? What would you order? Electric choice in Snohomish. What? Electric? No, I'm not going to say a choice. Collector's choice. Collector's choice in Snohomish. They serve food? Every now and then. 
Okay, that, that, sounds, that sounds good. So, yeah, John. Yeah, yeah. I would like to go to Capernaum. Yes. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. There you go. That's way better than mine. I was going to say like Daniel's Broiler in Bellevue, right? I've only been there a couple times when somebody gave me like a really big gift card. <laughs> but their steak, it just tastes different. You just, it's like faba beef. No, no. Okay, all right. So anyhow, let me pray for us and then uh, we'll do some worship together. Father, it is just so good to gather together in your name. And right now we just want to turn our hearts, our minds, our words to you in worship. So help us to worship out of gratitude for all that you've done for us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. How are we all doing? <laughs> A lively bunch today. Um, <laughs> you know, I've been, I've been reading through, been reading through the New Testament this year, and I was in, in Hebrews last week, and um, I was reading in Hebrews 11, and it's one of my just favorite chunks of scripture. Um, and I kind of I chalked it up a little bit here to, to read a couple of these things um, before starting today. And uh, these are just, it's pretty, it, it really hit me. It really hit me in a new way. Um, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by his acceptable gifts and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to a place that he was to receive an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age since he since she was considered, since she considered him faithful who, he, who had promised. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was faithful to act on offering up his only son. I want to have faith like those people. And, there's, and Paul goes on to write and says, I don't have time to write about all the people all these heroes of faith. So these are the these are the ones that I'll give you in this in this letter. And you know what? They had faith because our God is worth having faith in. He is worth following. Even if we don't see where we're going, he's worth following. Even if we don't know what his plan is, he's worth following. Even if it's hard, he's worth following. Even if it means sacrificing your only son, he's worth following. That's the God that we follow. Do you believe that? Yeah. Let's all get to our feet and worship. You make it easy to love you You are good and you are kind You bring joy into my life You make it easy to trust you You have never left my side You've been faithful Time. Come on, sing it.
that your prayer wherever you lead me whatever it costs me oh all I sing it Jesus so Sing it.
faith to follow you. going to wait until that day to praise your name as loud as we can. God, would you give us faith to worship in every circumstance until that day? Come on, lift it up together. Sing, oh, the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Raise your voice and sing together. Oh, the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great. Sing it. Shout your praise one more time. All together we sing. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. So great, so worthy. Oh, the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. Last time, we'll 
together. Lord, the earth will shout your praise. You are so worthy to be followed. Lord, you are so worthy of our whole heart, our whole affection, whole of our adoration. God, would you give us faith that no matter what circumstance we're going through, no matter what illness we're facing, no matter what mountain we're standing in front of, we would have faith to follow you through it. Lord, would we look back through scriptures and see these stories of these heroes of the faith and say, I want a faith like that. Lord, would you give us a faith like that? And would their faith give us confidence to follow you no matter what we face? Lord, we thank you for this time we've had worshiping you. It's in your awesome and holy name we pray. Amen. Y'all can have a seat. Let's, uh, let's thank Dave and Michael for help leading us in worship. Thanks, guys. That was an awesome time of worship. Good morning. Wow, that rocked the roof. Hey, guys, we're glad you're here. Before we do anything else, would you please silence your phones so that we will not get interrupted? Thank you. And in the spirit of music, we would like to honor all those who have birthdays in February. So please come forward, and we'll do our best to line up here and here as best we can to wish you all a very merry, merry, happy birthday. Come on, everyone. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. <coughs> we do have a list. And Marilyn, too. Marilyn has a birthday, too. She's got her hand up. Ready, everyone? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, you guys. That was awesome. Wow. We're really full today, aren't we? Before we go any further, I just want you to look around where you're sitting, see all the nice decorations on the tables, and everybody who remembered to wear red or pink or whatever, let's, <laughs> let's thank Brandy and her team for the decorations. Takes a lot of tablecloths, doesn't it? <laughs> we have a very first time visitor today. Her name is Valerie Barber. Valerie, where are you sitting? Right there. Welcome, Valerie. We're glad you're here. That means it's 150 what today? I don't know, a lot. Uh, I want to say hello to all of you in TV land who are watching us via the video that we record every week. I know that you cannot all be here, so we want to make sure that you know we're thinking of you. So everyone in this room, let's clap and yell hello to them. Come on. We miss you guys, and we hope that someday 
and we pray as well, that you'll be able to come back. And then we'll have to have a double-decker room because there's a lot of people at home watching us. So come back when you can, okay? So um, I don't ha have any announcement. Oh, yeah, I do. I have an announcement, and my announcement is Anita has an announcement. Hello, everybody. Hi, Keith and Louise. This is for you. They sent me a little note saying that they miss all of us, but he's so crippled up with level three arthritis in his right hip that life is real a real challenge. So um, he needs our prayers. And he can't drive anymore but they have a senior life group that come to their home on Mondays, so they are isolated as much as what we might think. And they're studying Second Peter, so if anybody wants to join them, call, give them a call. And um, he still remembers most of the scripture verses that he's learned as a child, so he's doing real well. Convey our heartfelt love for all the seniors. We miss all of you, but you are in our prayers. Blessings, everyone, with Christian love. Keith and Louise Corner. Thanks, thanks, Anita. And thanks, Keith and Louise. We miss you guys. Hope you can come back soon. And if you can't, just keep watching. That's it. You won't miss a thing if you keep watching, except maybe hugs. Yeah. <laughs> so today I have a couple of prayer requests. And a couple of praises. Praise from Dell Enzi. Dell, where are you sitting? Right there. Dell is announcing that he and Donna are celebrating their 68th anniversary this Friday. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> Donna, I don't know how you did it. Oh. <laughs> oh shoot, yeah. <laughs> Congratulations, you guys. Margo Howard, where are you sitting, Margo? There's Margo here. She has a praise. Our middle grandson, Duke, has finished his apprenticeship. Oh, Drake. Yeah, you're right. Sorry. <laughs> uh, has finished his apprenticeship program with, a, a, is it Gerber? Gerber. It's that difference in the pronunciation of that G. Yeah. Auto body shop in Woodville, and he bought a home back he bought a house back in Louisiana near his parents. Well, that's a big praise for Drake. Okay, let's give God the praise for that. Okay. <clears throat> I have a praise as well. I haven't shared with you for a long time. My daughter, Joan, who was in the uh, motorcycle accident last April, and that accident, for those of you who don't know, um, in that accident, she lost her husband, and she almost lost her leg. Um, she was in Harborview for a long time. To make a long story longer, uh, she's been going to PT regularly, and she took, hang on, she took 25 steps the other day <laughs> with a little bit of those banister hold-on things, which is an, a, it's a praise. Let's give God praise for that again. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that with me. Yeah. Other prayer requests from Margo. Uh, their daughter Molly and her husband Jason are driving up to Washington for our other grandson Xavier's wedding. Please pray for travel mercies. And the last prayer request is for Mike, Margo's husband. He has an appointment with a new heart doctor this afternoon to discuss a procedure that they will have to have. Give, uh, God give the, us wisdom and give Mike peace. We'll pray for you guys. Kim McCormick has uh, requested a couple of prayer requests. Please pray for Bob Stokey. He has been in and out of the hospital. Bob, you're here, aren't you? Bob Stokey, yeah, he's right there. Yeah. And also pray for Dave Prespa, who's also here. Dave, would you raise your hand? Here's Dave, <coughs> who, will be, uh, who will undergo hip surgery next week on this day, the 15th. So let's, we'll pray for both of you guys. And this is from Bob and Diane Bernhoff. Pray for guidance and peace for our daughter, Heidi, whose nine-year-old son, Nolan, 
has severe anger issues. So we'll lift up um, Nolan in prayer as well. Where are Bob and Diane sitting? Over there, okay. The reason I ask you guys to raise your hand for a prayer request or a phrase is not everybody knows everybody, so just kind of put a face with a request, okay. Um, okay, that's it, and so I'm going to have Dave Prespa. Could you could hobble up here, please, and <laughs> in, your, in your last week? Oh, look at you. <laughs> and you need a hip replacement? <laughs> God bless you. God bless you, everyone. I love you. I have to try to do that until I have my operation because I don't know what's going to happen after that. So, <laughs> um, you know, this month is kind of interesting. Uh, the 11th of this month would have been our 50th wedding anniversary. We were always trying to catch up with Dell, but we didn't quite make it. So, <laughs> and then uh, I lost my wife basically on the 26th of February. So it's almost a year that she's been gone. And I just want to extend my thanks for this whole group. I mean, you guys have been just a blessing to me being single now and trying to, you know, carry on my life as, as it just, it's just kind of weird. It really is. But, but God's there. And I just, I just, I can't thank him enough and thank you guys either. So, all right, let's go to prayer. And uh, let's, uh, Father, we come before you right now. We thank you for this time to gather. We give you all the praise and glory. Lord, you know about these prayer requests. You know everything that's going behind behind the scenes. And we just ask that you would just uh, uh, use your will to heal these people, dear Lord, that are sick and have injuries and whatever the, the case may be, dear Lord. We just, uh, we, we turn them over to you and we just thank you for all that you've done for us. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so go ahead and grab your Bibles and open up to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to get there in just a second and cover another big hunk of, of Philippians chapter 2. And as I was, I was reading this hunk of scripture and thinking about application for us, I, I got to tell you, I was reminded of, a, of an article that I read in the paper. Remember when we used to have those? That I read in the paper a few years ago. And uh, I just want to... I want to read it to you. This is really interesting. The, so the title is, or the headline is, Man Dies When Sinkhole Opens in California Home. All right? So here it is. The date was April 24th. A large sinkhole opened up in the middle of a house. Sinkhole. <laughs> sinkhole opened up in the middle of the house, um, swallowing up, or however you say it, a 27-year-old man who plummeted 10 feet and was covered by rubble officials said on Sunday. So it's just a normal day, he's sitting there at the table drinking coffee, maybe he's got the paper open, whatever, looking at ads from <coughs> Fred Meyer, figuring out what he needs. And then all of a sudden this hole opens up and he's gone. The two-story home was built in the 1980s and it might have been sitting atop a decades-old underground mine, authorities said. Recent rains possibly softened the ground under the home in an isolated area near Lake Alta, close to Sacramento. It's unbelievable, the police spokeswoman said. From the front of the house, it's absolutely normal. Then in the middle of the house is this enormous hole. And I started thinking, you know what? There are a lot of lives, a lot of situations, a lot of houses, a lot of churches can look so good from the outside. But then when you start to dig into them or dig under them, you find out, there's trouble brewing. And that's why home inspections are so important before you buy a house. <laughs> just, just saying. But Paul, Paul had just gotten, the Apostle Paul had just gotten an inspection report of sorts from his uh, friend Epaphrodites about the church at Philippi. And so Epaphrodites came to visit him in jail and, and starts telling him about the church. And overall, the outside of the church, the church of Philippi, looked awesome. I mean, everything was going great. They loved their first leader, their pastor, the Apostle Paul. They didn't have any big doctrinal issues that, that they were dealing with, and they were growing in their faith. But if you dug a little bit underneath the crawl space, you could see that there was a potential problem growing. There, were, there was a disagreement between two key people, two members in that church, and in chapter, Paul, in chapter 4, Paul's going to deal with it specifically. But as we walk towards chapter 4, you're going to see little hints of it in several places. And I think what, what we read today is sort of a hint of what's coming. 
Paul is building up to deal with that problem specifically. And here he gives them and us three big suggestions. Actually, they're commands in dealing with the problem that he sees brewing. So as we look at this, remember, this is all still flowing from this idea we've been looking at the last couple weeks. This idea of living a humble, loving life for each other in humble submission to God following the example of Jesus. So let me read this. It's a pretty big hunk. Philippians chapter 2. We'll start reading in verse 12. And I'm reading out of the ESV, English Standard Version. Therefore, Paul says, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor, labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice, the sacrificial offering of your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Let's pray, and then we'll dig back into that. Father, uh, boy, I just thank you for the chance for us to meet together today. And I pray that you would stir up our affections for you, that you would stir up our affections for each other, that you would stir up your power that resides in us. Cause us to be a light that shines for you. Encourage us, convict us, teach us from your word this morning. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, I hope you still have your Bibles open. We're just going to walk through this passage. There's actually a lot to cover. And just a word of warning, this passage doesn't break into a cool little, you know, three-point three point sermon, but I tried to make it kind of that way. But we're just going to work through this passage together. So let's pick it up in verse 12 again. Got your Bibles open? Verse 12. Therefore, okay, stop right there. All right, so <laughs> whenever you see a therefore in the Bible, you should always stop and go, what is that therefore, therefore, right? What's, what's the therefore, therefore? What's it referring to? And Paul is referring back to these ideas that he just dealt with. You know, and we're still looking at this idea of humility and unity within the church. But this is the bread on the other side of the big meat, a hunk of meat that we looked at last week. Jesus' life. So because of all that you have in Christ, that's verses 1 and 2. If you go back to the beginning of Philippians 2. Because our desire should be to live for each other, not just uh, ourselves, and pursue humility, which brings unity. That's verses 3 and 4 in Philippians 2. Because of the example of the sacrifice of Jesus, that's verses 5 through 11. Because of all that, therefore. Okay. So now he's going to tell us a little bit more what to do. So back to verse 12. This brings us to our first big idea, our first fix for the problem that Paul sees brewing underneath the surface of the church. And here it is. Fix number one is to work out your salvation. So first, he gives them a little pat on the back. Some might say he's kind of like, you know, buttering up before he smacks them. Um, but here's what he says in verse 12. Again, he says, therefore, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence. He's saying, man, you guys have a great tr track record of obedience. It really is. It's pretty awesome what you're doing. You don't need me or anybody looking over your shoulder all the time. I mean, you get it. And now as he says that, you almost get the impression that there's another command coming. And that's exactly what we get here. And here's the, the first fix. That's true, but the second half of verse 12. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, if you're like me, Andy, are you back there at the, at the counter? Can you? There we go. All right. Um, so if, if you're like me, you might just be casually reading along in your Bible, and one day you read this, and it might freak you out. What? I'm supposed to work out my salvation with fear and trembling? I thought salvation was free, and I can't earn it. C can I? I'm supposed to work for it to be saved? And if I don't, ugh, it's like, wait a second, Paul. This sounds 
way different than what you say in so many other places. I'm really supposed to be afraid with fear and trembling that if, I'm, that if I mess up, I'm going to lose my salvation. If I'm not good enough, God's going to kick me out. I, I just say, slow down, relax just a little bit. <laughs> Let's take a good look at what Paul really says here. First, what this doesn't mean. Now, clearly, he does not say or mean that I have to work for my salvation. I mean, that's not taught in the rest of the New Testament at all. And it's not what, what's being taught here. My salvation is initiated by God. It's offered to me by God as a free gift. And when I accept that, he implants it in me. I mean, that's clear in so many places in Scripture. Paul, as he writes to another church, the church at Ephesus, he puts it this way. He goes, for it's by grace you've been saved. Hello? Through your little bit of faith, Jeff. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. I can't earn my salvation and then brag about it. It's all about Jesus. I can't work for it. If we could, I guarantee you that God never would have sent his son Jesus to die on a cross like we talked about last week. He'd just say, come on, try harder. You can do this. Come on, you got this. Try harder. So what does work out my salvation with fear and trembling actually mean then? Well, here's, here's what I think it means. And here's what I think this means. And, and remember, he's writing to people who are already believers in this church. I think it means that because you're already saved, because you've experienced love and forgiveness, because God has already entered into your life in the person of the Holy Spirit, because you have his power at work in you, because he's the one working in and through you, that's what Paul clearly says here, because, and because the world is watching... Because of these things, I should be striving, working to express that incredible gift of salvation with my conduct, with my life. It doesn't mean work for it or you're gone. It means you've been given so much. You should intentionally use your life as a witness to others. I mean, if I work for Woods Coffee, which I love Woods Coffee. Anybody Woods Coffee? It's down the street in Buffalo. It's if I work for Woods Coffee, I'm not going to run around drinking coffee from a Starbucks mug. As cool as this mug is, I got this one in Peru on a mission trip one time. But I'm going to have my Woods coffee. And if I'm a Woods man, I'm going to be a Woods man representing Woods and handing out Woods gift cards. Who, who wants to go to Woods? Come on. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. See, that's kind of. There, there's one. Somebody else? Somebody else? You're all about Woods? There we go. All right. Um, I told you this before, but I know the owner of Woods. He's a neat Christian man. Um, and he uses, oh, he, he's so generous with what he makes. But anyhow. Yeah, if I'm going to say that I'm a believer, then I want my cup <laughs> to reveal that, and I want to be handing out gift cards. Well, anyhow, you, 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 I, I think you know what I mean. But there should be this growing desire in us to please God. Now, I was thinking about this. When I accepted my Woods coffee cup and accepted Christ into my wait, no, and accepted Christ at Warm Beach Camp when I was a junior in high school. Uh, not everything in my life changed overnight. Anybody else? I don't. <laughs> Not everything changed overnight. But so much did change. That I, I didn't even understand the depth of what changed that day. There was now this growing desire in me to please God. There was a huge, what I'd, what I'd call an attitude change. My life was now, I felt like it's not about pleasing me. It's about pleasing God. It's about saying with my actions, thank you for all that you've given me. And that attitude change started to uh, be, started being revealed in my behavioral change. But it didn't happen overnight. Now, sometimes I hear people say, oh, I used to be addicted, you know, to drugs or porn or country music. Or, or I, I had this huge anger problem. And then all of a sudden I accepted Christ and boom, it was just all gone. Awesome. And that happens. But I think more often I've found... That when a person first accepts Christ, their motivation for living has changed. Their attitude's different. But working out our salvation is just that. It's work. It's growth. It's what we call a big S word, sanctification, right? The process of becoming more and more like the example of Jesus that we've looked at these last couple weeks. It's how we react to God, to what God offers us. He initiates and we respond. 
um, I, I heard a theologian say it this way, and I actually think this is pretty cool. He goes, divine sovereignty, I mean God's part, and human responsibility, our part in salvation, he says are like two pedals on a bike. And I, I kind of like that. I don't think you want to uh, just uh, eliminate one and just say it's all about the other. It's not one or the other. It's both in tandem. I, I ride my exercise bike most days. I go home from work and I jump on my bike. Yesterday I was riding in Italy, uh, virtually, not for real. Um, <laughs> but I can't imagine trying to do the, the, uh, the exercise I was doing with my coach on the TV yelling at me without using both feet, right? You can't make it work with just one foot. See, God gives us new desires, so we need to feed them, nurture them. I mean, God convicts me of sin, so I work at repentance. God teaches me something in his word, and I learn it. I work on it, applying it in my life. He gives salvation, and in his strength, we work it out together. God initiates, we respond, and together we make progress. His desire is me pedaling down the pedaling down the trail, you know, hair blow, well, not hair blowing in the wind, but let's just say hair blowing in the wind with a bug, you know, bug-filled smile on my face going, yeehaw, this is awesome. But the problem comes when I start hitting the brakes or start going off the path a little bit. And, and I acknowledge there's going to be conflicts in, of desire at time, and that's called temptation, and we all, you know, deal with that at times in different ways. And I need to learn to pedal through those times with with not the fear of losing my salvation, but with the fear of losing my momentum and the fear of losing my, you know, getting my life out of sync with the flow of, of God in my life. Now, again, not the fear of losing my salvation if I get off the shoulder just a little bit. And sanctification, I think, really is better as a team effort, right? He works and we work. And we work much easier when we're all working together in, in a community of believers, kind of like what we experience here and then in our smaller groups as, as life groups. So fix number one, Paul reminds them and us that it's God who's working in and through us, so work with him. Don't work against him. Don't be hitting the brakes as you pedal or, go, or going off the path. So that brings us to fix number two. And I'm not sure I really like this one. I don't know. If, if you read ahead, I mean... Okay, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just do it. Here we go. Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 14. Here's what he says. Do all things without grumbling or questioning. Say what? Well, let, let me keep reading. Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Holding fast to the word of life. Okay, so look at that. Do all things without grumbling or complaining? That's fix number two. Don't grumble or argue. Wh what? Do everything without grumbling or arguing? Everything? In the Greek, it's got to mean something different, right, Pastor Jeff? It, it can't just mean do everything without grumbling or complaining. I mean, come on. Stop complaining. Stop arguing. That's exactly what he means. Now, I didn't really like this fix. You know, at first you're reading it and I go, uh, I wonder if there's a way I can find around it. So I, I compared some different Bible translations thinking maybe that would help. You know, and so I started with the NIV. That's sometimes a little sketchy. So it's a, but it says, do everything without complaining or arguing. Oh, stink. Well, okay, what about the ESV? That's, the, you know, that's our, our version here at, at uh, Canyon Hills. It says, do all things without grumbling or questioning. So complaining, arguing, grumbling, questioning, none of that. All right, the message, that gets really weird sometimes. Maybe that will work. Do everything readily and cheerfully. Awesome. Wait, with no bickering, no second guessing allowed. Fine. What about New American Standard? That's my best, that's my favorite version of the Bible. Here it's translated, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Okay, what about the kid's Bible? Maybe. It says, be quiet, drink your juice box, and do what mom says. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. Father, it's been such a great morning. No, I, I made that last one up, just so you know. But, but Paul's message here is so clear. Do everything, everything, everything without complaining or arguing, without whining or fighting. And then if you do that, he says, you're going to stand out. You're going to stand out in this world. 
And don't forget the example that we're supposed to be following. It's the example of Jesus who willingly left heaven without a wine. He becomes a man, no complaints. Now, later he turned water into wine, but that's a different kind of wine. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. He, wait, that's funny. Okay, all right. But, um, but he didn't go, no, Dad, I don't want to become a human. Have you seen those guys? I mean, it's a wreck. No. He intentionally became a man on purpose so that he could identify with us and then eventually die for sins, sins that he never committed, no arguments, no whining, no complaining. In fact, the writer of Hebrews puts this spin on it, and this is so good. He says, let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Look at this next phrase or line. Who for the joy set before him, he knew what was coming, and he considered it joy. He endured the cross, scorning the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Considered him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you don't grow weary or lose heart. Pretty good example, right, Jesus? So next time that I feel like whining or arguing, I'd do well just to take a deep breath and open up to Hebrews 12, verses 2 and 3, and look at what Jesus went through. But the message here is simple and clear, isn't it? If we're going to live at peace with others and God, we should not complain or argue. And what, what I struggled with a little bit, because this is Paul, right? He writes these long sort of run-on sentences. But I struggled a little bit with the connection of not complaining or grumbling or arguing with the result. You know, that he says that by doing this, you will become blameless and pure, children of God without blemish, and that this would make us shine like lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. I mean, how does one lead to the other? He seems to be saying that, that when it comes to God's direction in our life, whether it comes through his word or maybe, uh, you know, another believer that he brings in our life, um, that we're not to complain or argue. Or, or another thing that God will often use is circumstances in our life. But we shouldn't complain or argue. He's saying it does no good, none, not a zip, zero, nothing, does no good to whine or question or moan. Or argue with God. Now, sometimes we'll have questions for God, and you know what? He's okay with those questions. But we can't live in the whining. And if we decide to fight with one another, and usually that happens out of pride. We looked at that the last couple weeks. Or complain and argue with God about what we have or what we don't have, then lesson learning and growth is a lot tougher. But if we're living with gratitude and humility, others notice that. They go, there's something a little different about you. See, now when you think of people in the Bible who were grumblers or complainers, who comes to your mind? People in the Bible who were grumblers or complainers, who comes to your mind? Anybody? You, Israel, Israel, that's what we're going to look at in a second. Jonah, Saul, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are some. Those examples are for us. But the first thing that comes to my mind, I think the classic grumblers were God's people when Moses was leading them out of Egypt toward the promised land. I just, I just finished reading through Exodus in, in one of my Bible reading plans, and now I'm in the book of Joshua. Oh, man, I, I love Josh. I love that book. It's so good. But uh, if you, if, as you're reading through Exodus, you see that when they were in Egypt, they grumbled a lot, you know, Right? Where are you, God? I thought you were a good God. You did all this stuff in the past, but now we're stuck in this horrible country. We need to get out of here. It's horrible. Please help. Right? So God sends him Moses. Not exactly what they were looking for, but okay, God sends him Moses. And then through the plagues and the Red Sea, he leads them to freedom. That is pretty cool. You think they'd remember that and keep walking forward with that in their mind, but no. Then they start grumbling about food. We're hungry. Give us something a little different to eat. You brought us out here to kill us. I just want to go back to Egypt. So what's God do? Gives them food. They don't even have to work for it. Manna from heaven just falls from the, from the sky. No supply chain issue, you know, with God, right? No supply chain issue with God. It just shows up. But then they start complaining about the water. Oh, we need more water. So, you know, we might ask for coffee, but they're asking for water. So, 
So God gives them water that flows from a rock. I mean, clearly a God thing. So they're thankful for a couple minutes. Then they start complaining about the food again. We're tired of manna. Oh, mercy. There's only so much you can do with this. You know, manna squash, manna cotti, banana bread. You know, that's it. We want some real meat. Not, not pork. We, you know, we don't want to make you mad. But we want some real meat. So he just gives them meat. You know, day's worth. Shows up at their front porch all the time. You know, it's just waiting for them in the morning. You know, you're reading through this, and he even made their clothes so that they didn't wear out. What? And their shoes. Yeah, you know, I, some are going, yeah, but I'm tired of this beige thing. I was thinking of a more desert camo tunic. You know, that would be nice. Come on, God. It was just constant grumbling and complaining to and about God and the leadership that God placed over them. So the trip to the promised land, which should have only taken a couple weeks. I mean, if you look on your Bible map, it's not that far. It's not that far. But it ends up instead taking them how long? 40 years. 40 years. You talk about a, are we there yet, Dad? Right? <laughs> Why 40 years? Because they couldn't learn the simple lesson that he was trying to teach them in preparation for entering the promised land. And here it is. Stop whining. Trust in me. Simple enough, right? So they did circle after circle in the desert like for 40 years. Dad, that sand, sand dune, it looks familiar. Yeah, son. Yeah. Third time we've been by it. Second time you said that, you know. So when did they stop their whining? When they died? Now, my hope is that I'll stop whining before I die. Uh, and stop arguing with God about the lessons that I need to learn. But not a single adult from the Exodus generation, except for Joshua and Caleb, walked into the promised land. God set it all up for them. It would have been so awesome. But because of their complaining and arguing to God, they never saw it. Joshua and Caleb got in because they learned the lesson early on. Nobody else did, not even Moses. He was a little bit of a complainer, more about the people that he had to lead, which I totally get. Not that you guys are bad, but anyhow. So. <laughs> but unwillingness to receive instruction and guidance from God and ungratefulness for what God had provided led them to not experiencing what God wanted them to experience. Somebody needs to write that down. That's really good. See, we can learn whatever God is trying to teach us. It could be anything from a lesson about our finances or relationships or habits or trusting God with an attitude of humble obedience. Or we can go to the grave fighting with God for control over uh, our own lives, independence. And, for, and we can go to the grave complaining about what we don't have. <sighs> See, my, my hope for you and my hope for me is that our pride and potential to grumble and complain with God doesn't keep us from the next step in our, in our growth that he wants to give us or the promised land of satisfaction that's waiting for us. So, promised land or grumbling, Jeff, you make the choice. All I know <clears throat> is that God's really clear. That humility breeds dependence on God, which leads to a life of growth. And causes us then to shine as lights in the midst of a pretty dark world. I don't know if you've noticed lately. But I love that illustration, that idea that we're supposed to shine like stars in the universe. Isn't that cool? It really is. And, and I think the way that we're supposed to shine is the way the moon shines at night. At least when the clouds are gone. I think that the way that we're to shine is like that. I mean, the moon has no source of light on its own. You knew that, right? I mean, they, it's not just hanging up there and he pushes a button every night and all of a sudden it lights up. It it's just basically a huge dirt mirror that reflects the sun. Hmm. Yet we're totally fascinated with the moon. As a country, we spent billions of dollars and risked the lives and sacrificed the lives of a lot of people to get there and stick an American flag in the ground and then bring back some rocks how many of you remember this, right? You, you may remember this. I remember sitting in my grandfather's living room, I think it was July 20th, 1969, watching Neil Armstrong take those historic first steps on the moon. And it was so cool. 
You might also remember, and this was weird, I don't know why I remembered this this week, but they actually took some of those rocks that they brought back from the moon, and they took them on a tour around the United States, and people literally waited in lines for hours to look at moon rocks. Okay, incredible, right? It's incredible that we got there at all, but all things considered, I think I'd rather go to Hawaii. But... Um, <laughs> The amazing thing about the moon to me is this. What makes it so majestic and so, so incredibly beautiful and the focus, uh, you know, of countless pictures and paintings and poems and song. What a wonderful night for a moon dance with the stars up above in the sky. Yeah, okay, we'll stop. But <laughs> it's, it's not about what the moon is made of. It's about how it reflects the sun that makes it stand out. Boy, that's, just, that's the same with us, right? Absolutely the same with us. I'm just a, I was going to say dirt bag. I'm just a, I'm just a hunk of dirt. And most human beings are. My wife's a little different, but, but most, most are just hunks of dirt. But you find a human or a man or a woman who reflects the Son of God, and you know, you know there's something special about them. I mean, humans are just a hunk of pretty cool dirt that God used to, you know, his hands to build Adam, right? But if I can align my life in such a way that I reflect the son's life, the S-O-N, not the S-U-N. I think I said that right. Yeah. I can make a lasting impact on the world. And that causes us to stick out and draw attention to God for his purpose and for his glory. If we reflect what we see in here, in God's word, if we reflect that, and the example we see in Jesus' life, we're going to stand out and make a difference in this world for God. But here's the interesting thing. That same moon that can reflect the, the light of the sun can also cause an eclipse and block the light of the sun, right? Here's a cool little picture. I don't even know what all those words mean. But, you, you, you know, you get the idea. If I'm lined up in the wrong way, you know, this hunk of dirt that's me, I can easily become misaligned with God's Son and block the light of the Son instead of reflecting who He is to a dark, watching world. You get the illustration? I was in central Mexico on a missions trip when there was a total eclipse of the sun there. And it was crazy. It was like noon, and it was pitch dark. You know, and the chickens are crowing again, and the dogs are howling and all this stuff. We can reflect the sun, or we can block the sun. Which do I want to do? Does my life accurately reflect Christ's attitude and life to a world that's watching, or does it hide it? So, Paul's first two fixes. Number one, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You've been given a lot. A lot is at stake. Number two, do all things without grumbling and complaining or grumbling and arguing. Now, now when, when it comes to our behavior, I was thinking about this. When it comes to our behavior, I have some good news and some bad news. You ready? Okay, uh, bad news first, bad news first. You aren't perfect. In fact, look to the person across the table from you and say, you aren't perfect. No, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we... We are all fixer-uppers, right, in need of some remodeling by Chip and Joanna Gaines or something. But, but the good news is God doesn't require us to be perfect to have relationship with him. Amen? Anybody? Right? God expects direction, not perfection. If the, if the expectation is perfection, the result of my life is going to be frustration and failure. If the expectation is direction... The result's going to be sanctification, the process of becoming more like Christ. So we're to work on our direction and head in the direction of perfection. Perfection would be nice, and perfection is the direction I'm aiming for, but I'm just saying I ain't going to come to it this side of heaven. Did I just hear a relief, you know, a little sigh of relief from all the hard triers and prone to guilt and shamers like me? I should have. My part is to work out my salvation in tandem with God. It's to stop all the complaining and arguing with the direction God wants me to go in my life and then become that shining light. My worthiness to God <laughs> is all about him. 
My salvation and security are all about him because of the price that he paid. Now, don't hear that as an excuse for being lazy spiritually or for allowing sin to just run rampant in your life. So what it should do is cause me to relax a little, to trust in God more and not beat myself up so bad when I'm not perfect. Okay, so you're probably wondering why I brought this up here. I should have I brought like a golf ball or something and hit it into the crowd with you guys or something. That, that would have been good, right? No, maybe not, maybe not. Well, a wiffle ball, you know, it wouldn't hurt too bad. <laughs> but, um, again, it's all about direction, not perfection. This is a picture of me golfing. No, that is not a picture of me golfing. <laughs> what a beautiful swing. That's Pastor Steve golfing right there. But, this, this, so this is my driver. Men, uh, you might call this other things, depending on how you're doing that day. Some things you probably shouldn't even talk about in church, but, but that's a whole other sermon. I golf, but I'm not a good golfer. If I go once a year, I'm golfing regularly. Uh, but I do have fun. But when I step over the ball, my first concern isn't a hole in one. Right? My f- exactly. I just try, I just want to keep it on the fairway, please, Lord. I just want to hit it straight in the direction of where I want to go. Now, I've, I don't think I've ever heard. You know, <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard anyone, even the best golfer, playing a round of golf in just 18 swings. Anybody? Anybody? No, I just want to hit the ball towards the flag in the direction that will bring me safely to the flag. Now, I've been known to dribble off the tee or hit it into the woods or end up occasionally in, in, in the water. And uh, Pastor Steve's back there. Hi, Pastor Steve. Um, we were golfing together one time in Florida at a conference, and I hit my ball down by this little water thing, and I'm going over to pick it up, and I'm going, that's an alligator. Okay. (laughs) That ball's not worth it. All right, so uh, anyhow. But um, the point is, what we need to do is just set up our lives as best as we can to hit it in the direction of where we want to go, not expecting a hole-in-one with every swing. The more I strive to live my life heading in the direction I want, as he points me in his word, the more I'm going to please him and be that reflection of who he is to a watching world, right? The price that he paid for me is way too high. So I can't just nonchalantly go through life, you know, stepping up and swinging, not caring about the, where the balls go. That can't be me. A couple more things in this passage, you know, really quick. First... What is it that gives direction or inspiration or encouragement as we seek to live out humble obedience, you know, to the Father? What, what, what is it? It's the Word of God. Absolutely. And that brings us to fix number three, the Word of God. Look at verse 14 again. I'll get off the part that bothers me and get to the part that I really like. All right. Do not, or do all things without grumbling or questioning that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. It's all about the word of God. That idea there is I'm to hold tightly to the word of God. And that doesn't mean hold it like this, you know, I hold it close to my body, although that's not bad. But, but it means holding firmly to the principles, learning them, applying them, and living them out to a world that is watching me. One of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, and if you've known me for a couple of decades, you've heard me share this. One of my favorite verses in the whole Bible is Jeremiah 15, 16. And here's what it says. I told you we'd get to Jeremiah's favorite food. He says, your words, O Lord, they were found, and I ate them. And your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart, for I have been called by Your name, O Lord God of hosts. Jeremiah saw the word of God and he just goes, give me more, give me more, give me more, give me more. You know, and we need that same kind of attitude, the desire to feed on the word, digest it and let it affect us and live it out to a watching world. My attitude about feeding on the God's word needs to be more like a great white shark than a supermodel. Supermodels eat like a, oh wait, wait, supermodels eat this, Okay, supermodels eat this, you know, scrimpy little pizza, you know, barely, 
you know, little bits and they look all anorexic. Great White sees food and says, what? Attack! Now, this isn't a real picture. Those, yeah, you're probably glad to know that. This next one is a real picture, one of my favorites. But look at this. A Great White, I know, some people are like, Ugh. I had Lisa was putting together my slides and she saw the shark pictures and she goes, ugh, oh, this is awesome. Because that should be my attitude toward God's word. I want to eat till I'm full or till I, I run out of food. And I never run out of food with this book. The more I read it, I even you read it again and again and again, and it seems like the next time you eat it, something else tastes good that you didn't notice the last time. But a great white on a feeding frenzy is going to eat till he's overstuffed or he just can't. The, the food's all gone. And that should be my attitude towards God's word. And that's what impacts my reflection of the sun. As, as I take this in, digest it, and through the Holy Spirit help to live it out, that's what helps me to reflect Jesus to a watching world. What we feed on affects our physical and our spiritual health. Now, to summarize it, I think that Paul says this. Just please live this way. The, the, the way that we just look at, please live this way. Working out your salvation, understanding what's at stake, without grumbling or complaining, showing gratitude for everything I've already given you, and then shine as light, holding out or hold on to, holding on to the word of God. And if you do that, Paul says, you're going to make me proud. And I think God would say the same thing. You do that, and you're going to make me proud. Okay, so what I want to do right now, and this is a little bit different, but well, we got a couple minutes, is, is I want us to take some time around the table to discuss some application questions. So I'll give you just one question at a time, and then you just quickly talk about it around your table, and then I'll move to the next one, and eventually we'll close in prayer. Okay, you ready for this? All right, here's question number one. What kind of things make you grumble or complain? What kind of things make you grumble or complain? This is the easy question. Go ahead, share with each other. Okay, I'm, I'm sure you all didn't get a chance to share yet, but what are some of the things that came up at your table? Politics. Politics? Mandates. Mandates. Weather. Weather. Yeah. Oh, he just mentioned our president's name. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but do pray for him. Yeah. Yeah, there's all kinds of things that cause us to grumble or complain. So here's question number two. What are some things that you have that you're prone to take for granted, meaning you're not thankful for what you've been given. What are some things we're prone to take for granted? Okay? Could be physical or spiritual. What are some things you're prone to take for granted? Okay, so what are a couple of things that came up at your table? What are we prone to take for granted? Yeah. Home, just a place to stay. Yeah. Our life, just that we get another day. Our freedom, somebody said. Yeah. Te technology, which can be really helpful and good. And then sometimes not so much. But 
wait, I can't make this work on my phone. I'll hand it to my granddaughter. She'll show me how. Uh, okay, one last question. One last question. What are one or two ways you can better reflect God to a watching world? And maybe think of somebody else, not yourself personally. But what are one or two ways that we can better reflect God to a watching world? What kind of actions, attitudes reflect God to a watching world? Go ahead. Okay, a couple things that came to your mind. Yeah. Be open to the opportunity on a daily basis that God gives you. You mean to share about him? Or help someone? Yeah, Pastor Steve, well, oh, he was in Staff Chapel yesterday. Just talk about being ready to share our testimony and praying that God will give us opportunities to share our testimony, whether it's with our words or with our actions. Yeah. Something else? Yeah, John? Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, when you say walk with a repentant heart, what I think of is I need to be patient with others. Yeah. What's that? What? Oh, when you go driving, just letting people in? Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, no. Oh, just tolerating them, not letting them in. Okay, this is a great hunk of scripture that can mean so much to us. Next week, oh, you, you have one more? Shh. Oh, he said, cut the guy off who's going to cut you off. Cut him off before he cuts you off so he can see the Jesus fish on your bumper sticker. I'm not sure that's exactly... What we should do after I pray. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, let, let's pray. Wow. Uh, Fathers, we wrap up this morning. We just have so much to be grateful for. For your word, for salvation, for this encore community. We have so much to be grateful for. And I pray that uh, you just give us a picture into our own hearts and lives of what you want us to look like. Help us to see where we fall short, what fixes we need to work on. And then, Lord, I pray that this week would be a week of change for me. Where you'd use my life, use our lives, as lights to shine for your glory in a dark world that needs light desperately. Use us, change us, use us, keep changing us, keep using us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. As we build this hunk of scripture that we're memorizing, and, and you already gave it all for us, the whole thing. You just finished up the whole thing for us, the scripture we're building. Uh, this next week we're adding verse 6. And uh, so I want to say verses 5 and 6 together because they kind of fit together. But uh, before I do that, Judy Moan uh, puts these cards on the tables for us every week. Thank you, Judy. They're so helpful. And she put that whole hunk of scripture together and on one piece of paper so you can look at it. But let's say Philippians 2, 5, and 6 together, all right? We'll do the address before and after. Philippians 2, 5, and 6. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Philippians 2, 5, and 6. So I slipped into New American Standard. I do that all the time. That's why I've got it memorized in. Okay. And you had a, a quick announcement, Brent? Okay. I just wanted. It's okay. It's all right. Okay. He's, he's got you. I just wanted everybody to know that on the table out by the food 
are Valentines. If you haven't got a Valentine for your sweetie yet, pick one up and take it home to him. Yeah, but don't let her see you pick it up. <laughs> if, if you need one for just a friend, do, it, do take that. If there's Valentine's left, please take them. That's why they're there. Okay, all right. Awesome, awesome. Okay, I want to, yeah. I want to remind you, too, of this coming Saturday is Dr. Dwayne Brady's memorial service. It's this Saturday, February 12th, 11 a.m. in the upstairs chapel. I hope to see you there as we get to celebrate his life. Now, next week, okay, give me one more minute. Next week, we're going to be finishing chapter 2, looking at two great examples of people who lived out this principle. Boy, come back, bring a friend. We might be moving soon. We'll see what God has in store for us. But we're going to, I, I want to see us continue to grow. But bring a friend. Next week's message is so important. It's, uh, I'm going to give you a few relationship tips that Paul gives us. That will improve all of our relationships, okay? So next week, please come back. Oh, oh one more thing. Go Bengals. All right. God bless you. Hope to see you next week.